Overhead, a book TV original, written by Bill Messy Jr. Audiobook produced by Book TV. Dear reader, we would not be able to bring you these wonderful free stories without the help of our sponsors. Please visit novelnutrition.co and stock up on your reading supplements. Every purchase supports authors and free audiobooks. Character is what you are in the dark. Sermons, Dwight L. Moody. Passaic, New Jersey. Fall, 1983. Even before he's completely awake, Tiny Terry is aggravated. The phone wakes him up, and he almost squashes his iguana when he rolls over to grab the receiver to shut the phone up. It's his ex's lawyer, and he's talking about late payments, and Terry is only hearing half of it because he's still half asleep. I'm sorry for calling you so early, his ex's lawyer says, but I wanted to be sure I got you. Sorry my ass, Terry's thinking. He could have woken up and found this fucking weasel cutting out his heart with a dull butter knife, and this prick would say, Sorry, I'm cutting out your heart with a dull butter knife. Look, Terry, the lawyer is cooing. I know how much you hate getting these phone calls, and believe me, it's just as much as I hate making them. My ass, Terry thinks, you get paid to be a prick prick. You a friend of mine? What? I said, you a friend of mine? Terry, all I'm trying to do here. You're not a friend of mine, so stop calling me Terry, okay? The lawyer keeps talking, cooing, keeps calling him Terry, like squeezing Terry for money is some small thing between buddies. Terry lies back on the bed and drops the phone on the pillow. His iguana climbs up on the pillow and nuzzles up to the phone receiver. Birds of a feather, Terry thinks. When Terry shows up at his auto glass shop, he sees his guys missing, except for the two idiots from Lyndhurst he's got on the payroll. The idiots are playing hockey with a pair of brooms and a roll of electrical tape. He doesn't want to deal with the idiots just yet, so he goes into the office. Juanita's there, and she's got the company books open on her desk. Uh-oh, Terry thinks. She doesn't even say hello. That lawyer guy Barone called. I already talked to him, Terry says. When did you talk to him? I don't know, this morning. Son of a bitch woke me up. Well then, he called again because he called just a few minutes ago. Pain in the ass, that guy. He wants to know why you hung up on him. He says it's important. Something about... I know what it's about. He says call. Yeah, right. All a fucking business I gave that guy. That's what really burns my ass about that guy. When I was married, he was our lawyer. Then we break up and he jumps over to her. Guy's got some ass on him busting my balls like this after I used to pay his fucking bills. If I was him, I wouldn't have the fucking nerve. Terry. And then he acts like we're buddies or something. All the fucking money I gave this guy. Makes me want to go over there and set him on fire. Him and his whole fucking office. I should. I practically paid for the fucking place. Go over there with a fucking blowtorch. Terry. And now she's tapping the ledgers with her pencil. We have to talk about this. Where's the guys? Where's the rest of the guys? I see these two momos out there, but where's the rest? She tells him one called in sick, and she's got no idea where in Christ the other two are. Fuck, he says. Terry, I've been going over the books. Wait a second, he says. Let me go yell at these guys. This all you guys got to do? He yells at the two idiots from Lyndhurst. He knows it isn't because the cars they need to work on are all stacked up on the apron of the shop. He sees the caddy limo still there where it's been sitting for three days, and he groans. Then he groans a little louder when he finds somebody sleeping in the caddy's back seat. He goes after the Lindhurst idiots, screaming about who the fuck is sleeping in the caddy, which is supposed to have been done an out days ago. The Lindhurst idiots say it's a friend of theirs, and the guy's girlfriend threw him out, and he's got no place to go, so, so take him home with you. What do you think this is, some fucking hotel? Terry tells them he wants their pal gone, the caddy done, and he wants both taken care of that day, or else they're both going to join their pal sleeping on the fucking street. Back in the office, Juanita is still drumming on the company ledgers. You think you're aggravated now? Terry holds up his hands to tell her to hold off. Where's coffee? You got coffee? He goes over to the Mr. Coffee in the corner, 
but the pot is bone dry. There's no coffee? I'm not your secretary, Terry. Terry shakes his head. He keeps thinking that's exactly what she is, and he thinks, could we put the women's lib bullshit aside for just five fucking minutes in the morning to put on a lousy pot of coffee? Would it kill her? Would it set the cause of women back a million fucking years if she just put a lousy fucking pot of coffee on when she came in? I can't deal with anything till I get some coffee. You want some? Terry, you take no sugar, right? Light? We have to talk about... You want a donut or something with that? God damn it, Terry. This isn't the plan, Terry says to himself as he scoots out of the office. What it's supposed to be is Terry sitting on his ass in his office telling funny stories to customers and counting his money. Nope, not the plan at all. Terry had worked at the shop when Gorilla Mike owned it. Gorilla Mike was a shovel-faced Polish guy with long, thick arms, ending in frying pan-sized paws, and short, thick, bowed legs. He had small, cough-drop eyes, and one cheek or another was always bulging with a chaw of skull the size of a golf ball. Terry liked working for Gorilla Mike. Mike took good care of his people. He popped for coffee and donuts for them in the morning. He let them gas up their cars at the shop pump. Everybody got a bottle of something good at Christmas along with a check. Terry liked the work, too. He liked the way people would bring in cars that didn't work right, and they'd leave with cars that did. He liked the way so many of the customers knew Gorilla Mike. Hi, Mike, how's it going? They'd say, and Mike would hold up a finger for them to wait a second so he could spit out his wad of skull and then chat with them a bit. Terry especially liked the way people started asking to have him work on their car. He did a good job last time, they'd say to Mike and nod at Terry. Thanks, kid. Nice job, they'd say. Maybe even slip him a few bucks on the side as a tip. The customers would go sit with Mike in the office and work out the bill. And sometimes Mike would fudge the bill down a bit because they were regulars. Or they were having a bad day. Or money was a little tight. Just make sure you bring it back here next time, Mike would say. Don't worry about it, I'll tack it on when you bring it back, he'd say. And they'd laugh because Mike would never tack it on next time. And then he'd treat them to a Coke out of an old Coke cooler sitting on the apron. It was a big, fire-engine red thing, with the Coca-Cola script on the side. You left a dime on the machine, fished one of those little six-ounce bottles out of the icy water inside, popped it open with the opener mounted on the side. There was something about all of that that Terry thought was, well, nice. He used to think about the shop and how nice it was while he was sweating out 12 months in an army motor pool in NHA Trang. When Terry came back from Vietnam, Gorilla Mike would let him put in a couple of months at the shop when he needed a few bucks, paying him off the books. After Terry fell in with BB's crew and took down a couple of good scores, he didn't have enough money to buy the place from Mike, but he did have enough to buy into the place. Mike was getting older and he was thinking he could do without the headaches of running the shop. He made Terry a deal. For Terry's score money, Terry could run the shop, make whatever he could, and Gorilla Mike would come in once a month and take a piece. They toasted the deal with a couple of six-ounce Cokes from the cooler. Terry still has the cooler, only it sits out back of the shop by the dumpster with other rusted-out machines that don't work anymore. Terry doesn't get to sit in the office and schmooze because, whenever he's at the shop, he has to go chasing people around the shop to kick their asses and make them do some work. And there isn't always money to count, at least according to Juanita. Terry finally sits down with Juanita, and she starts working through the books with him. Terry doesn't understand much about the numbers, but he does get the drift about there being more going out than coming in. You have to stop taking out of the till, Juanita says, and she underlines the reprimanding sound of it by thwapping Terry across the bridge of his nose with her pencil. At least you have to stop taking out without writing it down. No. Terry says he'll write it down when he takes out of the till. It's not just that, Ter, Juanita says. There's what Mike takes out of the business. Jesus, Terry thinks. When's that old fart going to fucking die already? And there's all this crap you have going on off the books. You got so much going in and out off the books. It doesn't even pay to keep books. But you can fix it, right? Terry's more along the lines of pleading than asking. Fix what? All this? 
and Juanita waves her hands at the open ledgers like she's shooing flies. Is science fiction? Look, Tear, you're gonna end the month squeezed because there's not enough receivables to cover the nut. At least not on the books. Next month you're in the toilet. Next month is December and December is gonna suck. Nobody's got money in December. We never do business in December. People will be throwing their money at Christmas, not at you. Then in January, you got the balloon due on the mortgage. And I swear to Christ, I'm not going through that same crap this year when the taxes... Terry! Is that Milty? Terry's looking at one of his late people, bopping into the shop and high-fiving the two idiots from Lyndhurst. Terry, don't you dare. Just a sec, Jay. I gotta go out there and kick Milty's ass. Terry! Terry makes himself scarce that day. He tells Juanita he's got to deal with some vendors for parts, which is sort of true. They're not the kind of vendors where Terry can have Juanita put the transactions on the books. They're the kind of vendors where Juanita puts her hands over her ears and says, I don't want to know about it. Terry goes over to BB's Go-Go Bar, the Roma, and takes a lunch break that runs from 11.30 to somewhere around 2. BB's not around, so Terry hangs out in the bar and even helps the bartender smoke, bring up stock from the cellar, because he'd rather do that and listen to his knees grumble about going up and down the stairs to the stockroom, then go back to the shop. Terry orders some Chinese and treats Smoke and himself to some chafan and fried rice. They sit at the bar slurping down fat, greasy noodles, and Smoke keeps bringing Terry a steady parade of Dos Equis. How about I teach you to use chopsticks, Terry says. Nope, Smoke says. There's some hard hat guys in the bar for the lunchtime show, drinking mugs of bud and eating the rubbery hot sandwiches Smoke nukes up in a microwave. The hard hat guys don't seem to care much about the quality of the cuisine at the Roma. They're more interested in the bud and the dancers. Terry squints up at the stage. All the dos equis is starting to get to him a little bit, and between that and the colored light rig blinking at the stage, he can't really make out the girl swaying around in front of him. High cheekbones, almond eyes, Spanish, he thinks. He asks Smoke if she's a regular. He doesn't recognize her. New girl, Smoke says. As Terry watches her on the stage, he notices this new girl can actually dance. And she must be new if she thinks really dancing impresses the kind of guys who go into the Roma, because that's how she's moving. She knows some steps, does some kicks, can swivel her hips without letting it become a seedy grind. But seedy grinds are what people come to the Roma for, so she doesn't attract much interest. Terry says something about what a good dancer she is, and Smoke shrugs. Smoke plants another dos equis in front of Terry, and Terry's starting to feel warm and friendly toward the girl. Terry holds up a $5 bill for her, and she leans over and takes it, gives him a big smile and mouths, thank you, and does a few steps for him. Terry doesn't leer or stare at her legs or anything. He gives an appreciative smile and nod to show he's different from the other mamelukes in the bar, because he really does appreciate good dancing. She tags off with this other girl, and Terry can't remember her name, but she's a regular. She's not particularly pretty, and her thighs have quite a bit of jelly to them. The only step she seems to know is to spread her knees and shove her crotch in customers' faces. But that seems to get more bills stuck in her G-string than the for-real dancer got. There's a couple of guys in suits, banker types, probably from the fleet branch up the street, and they're sitting next to Terry, not even bothering about the rubbery hot sandwiches or the bud. They're doing shots and waving $5 bills at the grinding girl. For $5, she'll practically wrap her twat around your nose. After she's done giving the bankers their $5 worth, she works her way around the bar, and the bankers go back to bullshitting with each other. Terry half hears them. So you were in Japan? Yes, sir, the other one says. Yes, I rebob. Ten days? Yes, sir. Terry hopes the guy doesn't always talk like that. Maybe it's just the shots taking a toll. He doesn't even know these guys, and he's already pissed at them. He doesn't know for sure they're bankers, but he's pretty positive because in those suits they've got that look. And he's thinking these are the kind of douchebags bleeding him on the shop mortgage. And this is what they do with his interest payments. They come in here and piss it away on shots and bimbo dancers. Yes, sir. Ten days in the land of the rising sun, the one guy says. I was always curious about the Orient. I always wanted to go. 
Well, you should go, my friend. You should go. Me and Hetty, ten days in the Far East. Yes, sir. How was it? Did you enjoy it? I had a great time. Hetty didn't have a good time? If you ask Hetty, she had a lousy time. Figures. What's that mean? Well, you know, Hetty. No, I don't know. And when was the last time Hetty went anywhere and had a good time? Well, yeah. I guess she likes things the way they are. She's not open to different cultures and new things, knows her. No, sir, Bob. Although, frankly, it's not that different over there. Except for the bathrooms. The bathrooms? A lot of places for a bathroom. They still just have this little hole you squat over. You're kidding. I wish. I always figured, well, they have all this high-tech stuff. You know, Japan. They don't have it in the bathrooms they don't know, sir. We are light years ahead of them in toilet technology. Man, if I ever go, I'm going to stop taking my brand tablets. Trust me, you never see a Japanese guy order prunes and toilet paper. You bring your own. I hear that about a lot of places overseas. Yes, sir, Bob. No matter what businesses America gets beat on around the world, this country still makes the best toilet paper there is. Next time you wipe your ass in comfort, you think, made in the USA. Before Terry leaves the Roma, he calls into Juanita to see what's cooking. He speaks carefully so she can't hear all those dos equis mugging his tongue. He can tell she's pissed by the way she keeps her sentences to just a few words. And the words are small and cold. Anything come in I should know about? Terry says. Nope. Everything okay? Fine. Terry gives her some bullshit about going to a couple of car lots to see about some referral jobs. But he can tell she doesn't believe him. Really, he says. Fine, she says. And now he's getting pissed at her because she doesn't believe him. He's feeling a little woozy from all the das equis, and he knows he's in for a long night. So he drives back to his place and crashes on the sofa, watching Sally Jesse or some other blabfest and nods off. He wakes up a couple of hours later, and his iguana is curled up under his chin like a scaly beard. You miss daddy, he says to the iguana. But lizards being lizards, it doesn't answer. Terry does drive over to one of the car lots he deals with, a Ford place on Route 46. He bullshits with the service manager for a few minutes just so he can look Juanita in the eye and say he really was on business, even though he and the service manager don't talk any business. He goes back to the shop. He waves at Juanita in the office. She's dealing with some customers, but he can tell she sees him and is ignoring him. Man, he thinks. She is really pissed today. There's a special waiting for him in the shop, a job Juanita has tagged just for him because it's something she doesn't trust the other mopes in the shop to do. It's an ice cream truck, one of those ones where they dish the ice cream out a window in the side. The windshield is two large panels of sheet glass, and one of them is broken. The ice cream guy had taken it to an auto glass shop, but they told him they didn't stock that kind of glass. The problem, Terry knows, isn't that the windshield shop doesn't stock that kind of glass. Terry knows the glass shop where the ice cream guy went, and he knows the problem there is the glass shop guys don't like to work. If it's not a job where they can just drop in a piece of pre-cut glass and use a standard sealing kit, they won't do it. Terry tells one of the Lindhurst idiots to go over to the glass shop because he knows the guy's there and buy some sheet glass. The Lindhurst idiot doesn't want to go alone so he takes his idiot roomie. Come right back, Terry tells them. Okay, I mean it, there and back. While they're gone, Terry pops out the old glass. He has to do it carefully so he doesn't damage the rubber molding. The truck is old and he probably won't be able to find a replacement kit. He has to pry the molding out of the frame an inch at a time, gently with a screwdriver. He also has to be careful to keep the broken panel in as much of one piece as he can to use later as a guide. He cleans out the frame with a scraper, scaling out the old adhesive, then goes around the frame again with a stiff wire brush. The idiots are taking longer than they should, so Terry calls up the glass shop where he's sure they're standing around bullshitting with the glass shop guys. The guy from the glass shop lies and says they left a while ago. But Terry can tell by how much time passes between the time he hangs up and the time they get back to the shop with the glass that they didn't leave until the glass shop guy had hung up with Terry and said to them, You guys better get your asses back there. 
despite the fact he's afraid to go into the office and face Juanita, and all the crap with the ledgers and the idiots and who hasn't come to work and all that, Terry's feeling pretty good. Even after his nap, he still got a slight buzz from all the dos equis. And better than that, he's getting to do something he knows not a lot of other people can do. At least not as well as he can. Terry sets the new sheet glass across two sawhorses covered with ratty old carpeting. The carpeting protects the glass. He lays the broken panel carefully over the new glass. With a glass cutter, he traces around the old panel, etching the shape into the new panel. When he's got a good cut going, he takes away the old glass. He keeps going around the glass, freehand now, cutting deeper with each pass. The trick is to make a clean cut through to the other side. Terry knows if he tries to muscle the cut, he might dig out a splinter that could lead to a chip in the face of the glass. When he's cut pretty far into the new glass, he takes a can of lighter fluid and shoots fluid all along the cut in the new panel, then lights it. The heat from the burning lighter fluid softens the glass, so Terry can bend the part he needs to cut away further from the panel. This way he can get in deeper with the glass cutter, and finally, a little bit at a time, toggle the excess away from the panel. With the glass soft and him toggling it easy, it won't splinter. He smooths the edge of the new cut glass with a bit of steel wool and the wire brush, then wipes both sides clean with a rag and some gasoline. He dabs primer around the windshield frame and then along the edges of the glass, then puts new adhesive putty around the frame. He picks up the glass. It's pretty heavy, but Terry's been doing this a long time, and he's got the upper body strength to do this. He carries the glass over to the truck and sets it square in the frame. He taps the glass into place with a rubber-headed mallet, then puts the rubber molding back, wedging it back into place with a screwdriver, again gently, so he doesn't chip the edge of the new glass or break the molding. He goes around the edges of the glass with a razor blade, scraping away any putty that spread onto the glass from the frame, then wipes down the glass inside and out with paper towels and Windex. You should sign work this good, he thinks. By the time he's done, the crew has left, and so has Juanita. She must still be pissed, he figures, because she didn't come back into the shop to say she was leaving. Terry leaves the place open until the guy who owns the ice cream truck comes by. After Terry settles with the guy, he goes out and picks up some ice and beer for the night crew, then stops at a sabrette scooter on the corner for a couple of dogs he brings back to the shop. While Terry eats, he leafs through the ledgers Juanita was trying to walk him through that morning. He still doesn't quite follow the figures, but he does understand what all those entries in red ink mean. He finishes the dogs, then walks around the shop. He wonders what he'd do with himself if he didn't have the shop. He wonders if he'd really care at this point. As he's walking around the shop, he sees the caddy limo still parked out on the apron. Oh, Christ. The vendors Tiny Terry was dealing with that morning start coming into the shop after eleven that night. There's some kids Terry knows and some friends of the kids. Real low-rent street punks. Terry's idea is the kids boost some cars. Then he buys the cars from the kids and has a crew chop down the cars. He'll keep the parts he thinks are good for his stock, sell off what he doesn't need to contacts he has at other shops. He figures it'll save him a fortune in parts. Plus, he'll pick up a couple of bucks on what he sells off. He's already talked to the guys at the glass shop about unloading the window glass, and he knows another guy with a brake shop, and some other guys and so on. Terry's hired a crew of Jamaicans to chop down the cars. He's worked with them before. There are six of them, dreadlocked and stone-faced. They don't say much, keep to themselves, talk a little pigeon to each other, nothing more than, Hi, mon toss me dot torch, and stuff that Terry can't quite make out. They're polite and quiet, and as long as they get their money up front and he supplies cold beer, they work like steam engines. Terry asked Big Frank to come in because the punks are not pros, just some Spanish kids from Newark. They're not a crew, not even a gang, just some shithead kids looking to pick up a few bucks for dope or to add to their gold chain collection, maybe doing it just for kicks. Terry figures these shitheads are cheaper to deal with than a crew of pros, even though dealing with shitheads practically guarantees not a good harvest. Terry knows one of them, the top shithead, 
a little bitty kid who looks about twelve and makes Terry wonder how he can even reach a car's pedals. Terry and him have done business before, but the thing is, the word goes out, from him to shitheads Terry doesn't know. And he doesn't want one of them thinking something stupid. He doesn't want one of them looking at Terry paying them off his roll of green and getting a bit drooly. If one of them gets it into his head to try something stupid, the Jamaicans will be useless. They're good workers, but they don't look for trouble. A blade or a piece comes out, and they're, bye-bye, man. That's why Terry has Frank there. Terry prefers flashing Frank's 250 pounds, 6 foot 2 Hulk as a dissuader to flashing a 380 auto stuck in his pants. When Terry cruises by the Roma to pick up Frank, Cat Magnano is there and wants to deal himself in. He's crying the blues about needing a few bucks to get a real lawyer. This fucking PD I got, he moans. This fucking guy is killing me. This guy couldn't get innocent people off. Terry tells Cat Manano he can help chopping down the cars. He'll get paid what he's paying the Jamaicans. Cat thinks he should get more because he and Terry are on BB's crew. You want to stay here and cry in your beer about your lawyer or what? Terry says. I can't even afford a fucking beer, Cat Magnano says and climbs in the car. It's hot at the shop. The Jamaicans are working away, bang, 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 and they're using torches which are eating up the air in the place, but Terry can't open the windows. The shop's windows are painted over black, and he has to keep them closed, so nobody can see when he's pulling late-night hours and why. But the heat and torch fumes are giving him a headache. So is Cat Monano. The minute the cars start showing up, Cat Monano decides he isn't dressed right for working on them. He doesn't want to mess up his good threads, so Terry has to dig him up a set of coveralls. Cat works on the cars for a couple minutes before he decides he needs gloves to protect his precious hands. So now, Terry has to dig up a pair of work gloves. Cat Monano works a couple more minutes, then decides he doesn't know anything about power tools. So he says he'll just lug stuff around. Every time he lugs something around, he has to sit and catch his breath and dip into the cooler Terry stocked with beer for the Jamaicans. Cat Monano sits on the cooler and grumps. This fucking PD I got, this Theodore. Fucking PDs, Big Frank agrees. Fucking Cat Manano, Tiny Terry thinks. I gotta get myself a real lawyer, Cat says, and cries about how, with Theodore handling his case, he'll probably wind up getting the gas chamber, or however the hell Jersey is killing people these days. I mean, fucking PDs is no good anyways, Cat says. He reaches inside his borrowed coveralls and comes up with a roach. He lights up, takes a beer out of the cooler, and alternates between tokes and sips. Cat Magnano is pretty much talking to the air, because he's sitting there by himself. The chopping crew is unbolting, unscrewing, and torch-cutting, and Terry and Frank are making piles of quarter panels and window glass and whatever. Hey, you guys want any of this? Cat Magnano says, and holds out what's left of his roach. Not just yet, Terry says, not trying too hard to hide, sounding pissed. Cat Manano takes a long, long toke. He coughs. Man, that's some nasty shit. It's hard to get something nice don't cost you no arm and a leg. Life's a bitch, Terry says, grunting it out while he's carefully setting down a Buick windshield. Fucking PDs, Cat Manano says again. You figure a guy's word of shit. He wouldn't be no PD no more. This fucking guy, he got gray in his hair to sabes. The fucking guy is getting old in a PD's office. You got something on a ball at all, then you're out of there, right? You make your bones, then go over the DA or go private. Private, Frank said. That's where the bucks is. But if you're still sitting there when a hair goes gray, you're still just a lousy fucking PD. Yeah, Frank says. And it don't mean nothing good for nobody you're handling their case. Cat gives his roach a nasty look, then nods at the Jamaicans. I'll bet those guys know where the good shit is. Don't bother them. Terry says. That's all he needs. Cat Monano is doing near zero now, and then he'll tie up one of the Jamaicans trying to cop a cut rate on some ganja. As it is, Terry is waiting for the Jamaicans to start a beef about Cat Monano. Dot fucking guy sit there and smoke and drink me beer, mon. He better not be make the same money me make, mon. The Jamaicans finish up. The cars are stripped. The Jamaicans put the tools away. They even sweep the floor. Terry tells Frank. If I had guys like this on during the day, I wouldn't have to be pulling this shit at night. 
Terry pays off the Jamaicans. Terry thanks Christ. None of them say anything about Katmanano. All they say is, next time, Mon, and they split. What's left now is dragging the parts Terry wants to keep to the storage shed out back and loading the rest in a couple of the shop vans. Katmanano finally starts doing some serious labor, lugging parts to the shed. Terry thinks Katmanano thinks Terry will remember this last part where he's working his ass off instead of the first couple of hours where he fucked around. I got a flash for you, Cat, Terry says to himself. I am not forgetting. It's been a long night, and between the heat in the shop and the fumes from the torches, his head is killing him. It's like one of the Jamaicans is inside his skull with a mallet boom, boom, boom. Terry goes to his office and sits at his desk with his head in his hands for a minute. Boom, boom, boom. He goes into one of his desk drawers and finds a big plastic bottle of generic aspirin, but the bottle is empty. He goes to Juanita's desk and goes through the drawers. He finds a bottle of Midol. He goes back to his office reading the directions and warnings on the bottle of Midol. Now Frank and Cat Mugnano are in his office with the cooler of beer. Each of them has a can of beer, and Cat Mugnano has his roach out again. Cat has grabbed a pair of needle-nose pliers from one of the workbenches and is using them as a roach clip. What about foreign cars, Frank is saying. Some of those are pretty classy. You don't want no Jap car, Cat Monano says. I don't know, some of them look nice. I don't give a shit how nice they are, Cat says. The fucking tin break, you're screwed. Everything's gotta get shipped from fucking Tokyo. Terry isn't paying attention. He's been trying to concentrate through the boom, boom, boom in his head, focusing on the painfully small printing on the bottle of Midol. Hey, can I take this? He asks, holding up the Midol bottle. You got cramps or something, Cat Monano says, and laughs. That roach has him thinking he's a riot. No, I got this headache. I'm out of aspirin. I just want to make sure I can take this. Well, they get headaches when they're having their thing, Frank says. I don't see why not. I just want to be sure I take this. I'm not going to grow tits or something, Terry says. I can't even read this thing. It's so fucking small. You read this. And he throws the bottle to Frank. Maybe you should think about glasses, Frank says. Terry doesn't want to think about glasses. Jesus, Frank says, squinting. Maybe I need glasses. Terry lays back in his chair, rubbing his head and closing his eyes, and wondering when the hell these guys are going to leave. Terry cracks an eye open. Cat Magnano dabs out what's left of his roach on his tongue, then pops it in his mouth. A chew or two, and he washes it down with his beer. Cat starts laying out a line of coke on Terry's desk. I wish you wouldn't do that in here, Terry says. Grass is one thing. Coke. Cat Monano snorts up the coke through a tube he makes out of a five-dollar bill. It doesn't look like he's left anything behind, but just in case, he licks the tip of his finger and swabs the desk with it, then rubs his fingertip along his gums. Hey, you guys want to get something to eat? Terry? Come on, Frank, we hit a TikTok. They're open all night. Or maybe we go over the shortstop. Hey, Terry, shortstop, get some eggs in a skillet? Terry doesn't know why it's supposed to be such a cool thing for a diner to serve you eggs right in the skillet in which they were cooked instead of on a plate. But it's one of the shortstop's specialties. I got a pass, Terry says. I'm dead. Frank says he'll go. What the hell? I could eat. While Cat Mugnano bounces off to the washroom to clean up, Terry tells Frank to come back to the shop around seven so they can start trucking around those car parts. Terry tells Frank not to mention it to Cat Monano because he doesn't want Cat horning in on that part of the deal, too. Cat Monano comes back and Terry pays him. Terry was thinking of holding back some bucks, and if Cat beefed, telling him, too fucking bad, no worky, no money. But Terry doesn't do that. He pays him what he said he'd pay him. It's late, he's tired, his head is banging because the medole may be great for cramps, but it's not doing shit for his headache. He'd just as soon pay Cat off and get him out. After Big Frank and Cat Monano leave, Terry sits alone in his office and leans back in his chair. Terry bought the chair when he bought the shop. It's a big, leather-backed office chair, like big execs have, like bankers have. Only now, the leather is cracking everywhere, and the stuffing is spilling out. One of the wheels keeps sticking, 
There's a clock or radio on Terry's desk. Terry sets it for a quarter to seven, which means he'll get about three and a half hours sleep and have 15 minutes to get himself conscious before Frank gets there. Terry wants to be out of the shop and on the road with the truckloads of parts before 7.30, which is when Juanita will be by to open the shop, and Terry would really like not to be there then. Terry turns out the office lights. He leans back in the chair and puts his head against the cracked leather. Ah, shit, he sighs. And even with the boom, boom, boom in his head, he's so beat he's asleep in no time. The clock radio doesn't wake Terry up. Big Frank banging on the window of his office and shouting at him does. Jesus, Terry says, very aware of how dead he is this morning. He feels stiff everywhere. The clock radio is on, has been on since quarter to seven, but he hasn't heard it. He notes that Frank's late. It's ten after. Terry not quite completely forces himself awake to let Frank in. He opens the office door to the outside and a lot of cold air comes in. It's pretty gray outside. The streetlights are still on. Terry looks up and sees solid cloud cover. It wants to rain. Frank, God bless him, has brought coffee. Let's go, Terry says. He wants to be out of the office before Juanita comes in. He doesn't feel like dealing with her bullshit this morning. I gotta pee, Frank says. The cold makes me have to pee. Pee later. I can't wait, Ter. Terry lets Frank pee. He shouts at him through the washroom door to turn out the lights and lock up when he leaves. He pops two more of Juanita's middles and takes the bottle with him when he goes out into the lot and starts up the two loaded trucks. He wants to be ready to go as soon as Frank's done. Terry sits waiting in one van, bouncing in the seat, waiting for Frank. The cold has made him have to pee too, but it'll wait. The second Frank's ass hits the driver's seat in the other van, Terry launches out of the lot. He makes a left out of the lot instead of a right, even though he needs to go right. Juanita will be coming to work from the right. They drive the roundabout way over to the glass shop first, and things go pretty well. They take most of the glass off Terry's hands, but Terry has to eat two windshields because they're chipped. Terry tells the guys at the glass shop those fucking Jamaicans probably did it, although he's pretty sure it happened when he rocketed out of his shop lot so fast. Terry pees at the glass shop, then they start hitting the other shops. They go to the brake shop first, but the guy there doesn't want what Terry has. You told me you were interested, Terry reminds him. Yeah, I was interested. I didn't say I was buying. Then what the hell does interested mean? It means interested. It don't mean buying. The rounds go downhill from there. Everybody Terry thought he had lined up jerks him around. These guys are backpedaling to get Terry to drop his price, which really pisses Terry off. He knows that's what they're doing. They pretty much know he knows. And they all know there's not much he can do about it. He drops his price because he has to get rid of this stuff, which they know. And he doesn't want to just trash it all. He wants to get at least some bucks back, which they also know. Now, Terry is stuck with a lot of stuff he hadn't planned on being stuck with. He and Big Frank drive out to a junkyard he knows way out, on Route 46, out in the boonies, a place run by a pair of Greek brothers. He'd already made a deal with the brothers for the stuff he knew he wouldn't be able to sell off, like engine blocks and chassis, which the Jamaicans had very nicely cut up into handleable sizes. If a citizen takes that kind of stuff to the junkyard, the yard pays for it because they turn around and sell it to guys who deal in scrap metal. But Terry can't sell his stuff to them. The deal is Terry has to pay the Greeks to take it off his hands. The reason Terry is paying the brothers instead of the brothers paying Terry is because they know the stuff is hot. Terry paying them makes them forget things if cops come around asking about chopped car parts. The Greek brothers forget things like serial numbers and a description of the man who dropped off that Le Sabre grill and those Firebird wheel rims which draw the cops' attention because they have reports of a missing Buick Le Sabre and a missing Pontiac Firebird. But now... Terry has to pay the junkyard Greeks extra because he's showing up with a lot more stuff to get rid of than he'd made the deal for. Right now, Terry's wishing he hadn't thought the fucking deal up in the first place. He's out the money for the cars. For the Jamaicans and Cat Moniano, he still has to give Big Frank his end. And now there's the money, and the extra money, for the Greek brothers. Terry and Frank are walking back to their vans from the junkyard office, which is a trailer on cinder blocks. 
Terry counts out Frank's money for last night and today. He looks at the few bills he has left. He says to Frank, With my luck, I could rob a bank and walk out owing them money. Terry figures he owes himself and Frank a treat. He has Frank in the other van, follow him back down 46 and then into Newark. He goes to an Italian hot dog place he knows on Bloomfield Avenue, a little place squeezed in on a street corner, Dickie D's. He orders a pair of combos for him and Frank. Frank parks himself at a table, but Terry stands at the counter. He likes to see the sandwiches come together. Terry's been coming to Dickie D's since he was a kid, and there's something that makes him feel good about seeing them do the sandwiches the same way after all that time. If he'd had a kid, it would have been nice to do like his father did. Come here. Pick the kid up in his arms and go, See? See how they do it? Like a tradition, Terry thinks. Behind a plastic splatter shield, there's a flat-top grill, and it's set down a little bit, almost like a basin, so it can hold an inch or so of olive oil. The flat-top is always on, so the oil is always hot. When Terry orders the two combos, the guy behind the counter throws two Italian hot dogs crackling into the oil. He takes two pieces of sweet Italian sausage, splits each piece, and flattens them out so the insides will cook, and throws them into the oil, too. He pokes the dogs and sausages around in the oil with a fork, rolling and flipping them to make sure they cook through. After the dogs and sausages cook for a while, he uses his fork to drag a mix of peppers and onions into the oil from a pile on a little shelf over the flat top, and then hunks of potatoes from another pile go into the oil. The peppers and onions and potatoes are already cooked. The oil just heats them up. When everything's cooked, the guy takes a pizza roll, cuts it in half, then splits and opens each half. The counter guy squirts mustard and ketchup into the pocket because Terry tells him he wants mustard and ketchup inside and out. The guy shoves a dog deep into the bread pocket, then a piece of sausage, smothers them with peppers and onions, then he stabs at the potatoes crusty and brown from cooking in the oil and jams them in on top. He keeps shoving potatoes into the pocket until it looks like the roll is exploding with potatoes. The counter guy showers some salt over the potatoes, then gives them a squiggle of mustard and ketchup. Terry has the guy wrap up the two sandwiches. He buys a couple of root beers, and he and Frank take the food out to one of the vans so they can eat with some privacy. They park their root beers up on the dashboard, and Terry puts on the radio, one of the classic rock stations, the old tunes he used to listen to in the motor pool in NHA Trang. He and Frank slouch down in the van seats and start chomping their way through their combos. For a little bit then, things are feeling okay for Tiny Terry. His headache has faded to a soft throb. The aches in his joints from lugging heavy metal all night and all day are easing off too. The air in the van fills with the smell of potatoes and sausage, peppers and onions, and spicy Italian hot dogs. The tunes are good, and on a miserable gray day like this, the hot sandwich sets up a nice glow in his stomach. I'd like to get in on that junkyard business, Frank says. Now that's a racket. I mean, even when it's legit, it's a racket. What do you sell? You sell junk. People's is garbage. Junk's different from garbage, Terry says. You know what a difference is? Junk is garbage you can sell. Where's your overhead? People come to you. They come to you, and you give them a few bucks for their garbage. Then you turn around and sell it. Where's your overhead? You don't need no store, you just pile it all out there in a yard. It rains on your stock, who gives a shit? It's garbage. You don't need no salespeople. They come in, you say, go find it. These guys, those two Greeks, this is a real business to them, Terry says. You know, they bought themselves some computer. It's wild. All their junk is cataloged in that thing. You go in there, you say, I need a quarter panel for a 78 Impala. They punch it up on a computer tell you where to find it out in a yard, it's like fucking Sears, and then you pay. But it's garbage, Frank says. Junk, Terry corrects. It's different. I remember when I was a kid, you went to the junkyard, you know, you're working on your car. You need a new dash or something. You go out there. It was always some ugly old bastard, he goes. Five bucks for anything you find in a yard, and in you went. Now, like I said, they got a computer, little printer, there is spitting out your receipt. All for junk. All for junk. Somebody climbs over the fence to steal. What's a worse thing happens? One of those damn big-ass watchdogs? They got 
tears him a new asshole. That's pretty bad. Why even bother with a watchdog? So they steal some junk. You think nobody else is going to bring you more junk to sell? I'm telling you, that's a great fucking business. How do you get in that kind of business? What do you need? Just a big empty lot and start telling people to bring you their shit? It's got to be harder than that, Terry says. Otherwise, everybody would be running a junkyard. You find an easy way to make money, Frankie. You let me know. Right now, if I see a penny on a sidewalk, I bend over to pick it up. I know I'm going to fall over and crack my skull because that's how things are breaking. They finish eating. Terry tells Frank to take the one van back to the shop. Don't even talk to her, he warns Frank about Juanita. Just drop it off, throw the keys on a counter and get a hell out. Otherwise, she's going to tear you a new asshole. Terry takes Frank home in the other truck and drives it back to his place. What's the matter? You think I forgot you? He says to his iguana when he gets home. You miss me? The iguana sticks its tongue out, and Terry sticks his tongue out too. Back at you, he says to the iguana. While he throws some iguana food into the lizard's tank and changes his water, Terry hits playback on his message machine. There's another call from his ex's pain-in-the-ass lawyer, then Juanita still sounding pretty pissed. Terry feels sorry for Frank if he bumps into her when he brings the van back. In her message, Juanita says the guy with the caddy limo is royally pissed, and he says if Terry wants to keep the car so bad, why doesn't he just sign the title over, and Terry can give him blue book value on the car. Juanita says she doesn't think the guy's kidding, and does Terry know who stole her my doll? Then there's another message from his ex's pain-in-the-ass lawyer. By the time Terry's done listening to the messages, his headache has revved up again. Boom, boom, boom. This is all going to cost him. He can jerk the lawyer around, but to quiet down this guy with the caddy limo, he's going to have to do the job practically for nothing, and he's going to have to do something for Juanita to shut her up, some kind of bonus or expensive gift. He looks the iguana in his little beady eyes, or as much as he can, what with one iguana eye looking one way and the other looking off somewhere else, and says, I am just bleeding from the ass today. Terry calls the Roma. Smoke picks up the phone and Terry asks for B.B. A few seconds later, B.B. picks up in his office. Yo, B.B. says, I need to talk to you about something, Terry says. Maybe some work. Let me call you back, B.B. says and hangs up. B.B. calls back a few minutes later. It's hard to hear him because now he's calling from a payphone on the street. What's up, B.B. says. I was just wondering if you got anything cooking, Terry says. What are you looking for? I gotta tell you, Beeb, things are a little tight right now. I don't want to go out on the street for money. No, B.B. says, you don't want to do that. So I need a pretty good taste. If anything's cooking, Terry lets that hang. And there's a pause for a second before B.B. says, Somebody asked me for a body. A driver. What does the driver do? That's all. Just drive. How much? I can get you a ton and a half. Just to drive? If you don't want it, that's fine with me, Tear. No problem. You asked. I know somebody's looking. For when? Tonight? Okay. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I'll drive. Just drive, right? I wouldn't put you out there where there's too much heat. Okay, I'm in. You need a clean car? Something that blends in? Blends in where? Newark. Okay. Come by round nine. I'll buy you a drink. I'll lay it out. Terry looks at his phone for a minute, thinking, I've got to be some kind of real fucking moron, because he knows three grand is an awful lot of money to just drive. Terry cracks the living room window and stands there getting a rich whiff of the bakery up the block before he gets down his bottle of Jack Daniels from the kitchen. He takes a swig from the bottle to wash down a pair of Juanita's Midols. Still dressed in the shop clothes he's been wearing since yesterday, he shuffles into his bedroom and falls face down on the bed. He doesn't even bother to kick off his shoes. The dreams are the bad ones. Terry sleeps and wakes, staying in bed until he sleeps again, after which he wakes up again. It goes on like this for some hours. Around seven in the evening, he makes himself sit up in the bed. Out the window, he can see it's dark and it's raining, and he moans. The rain makes his joints hurt, 
especially this cold November rain. He sits in his bed for quite a while, trying to psych himself to get up and earn his 3,000 bucks. He takes a shower, pulls on comfortable dark clothes, a hat with a wide brim, then drives the van back over to the shop. He checks out the cars still on the lot. He needs just the right car. Foreign cars are out, not too many Audis and Mercedes where he's going. There's a quiet colored Pontiac couple of years old. Terry checks the paperwork on it. The car's just in for a tune-up. Terry runs up the engine. It's rough, but doesn't sound too bad. It'll be okay. He unscrews the dome over the roof light and pulls out the bulb. So when the doors open and close, there's no light and nobody can see into the car. He trades the Pontiac's plates with plates from another car on the lot, then drives over to the Roma. It's a weeknight, so it's pretty quiet in the bar. Terry waves smoke over. Tell the boss I'm here. B.B. parks on the stool next to Terry. Give the man a shot and a dos equis, he says to Smoke. Smoke puts a shot and a dos equis on the bar in front of Terry. B.B. waves a finger at him to leave the whiskey bottle. You're not drinking? Terry asks B.B. With my stomach? Terry says still has Juanita's my doll and takes two more, washing them down with a shot he chases with a sip of beer. What's that? B.B. says and picks up the my doll bottle. You having your little visitor or something? My head's killing me. You ever hear a aspirin? Terry swipes the bottle back and B.B. chuckles. They watch the dancer for a bit. She may be a little heavy, Terry thinks, but she carries it well, especially in the boob area. She's hanging on the poles at each corner of the stage that go up to the ceiling. She's got her legs wrapped around one of the poles and is rubbing her crotch up and down the pole. Bibi frowns at her and waves her away from the pole. I keep telling her not to do that, he tells Terry. It's not like those things hold up the ceiling. They're just like decoration. She's a right. Those things won't carry any weight. They break, she falls and busts her ass. Then I'm in court with a lawsuit giving away my bar. Nope. You think she'd sue you? They'd all sue. You think? Really? You think because I give them a bottle of cutty and a hundred bucks at Christmas they wouldn't sue my ass off? Finish your drink and show me the car. Let me get my coat. Then they're outside, walking to the Pontiac. They stay close to the storefronts along the street, trying to stay out of the rain. They're at the Pontiac, and B.B. nods a yes. They stand in a doorway out of the rain while B.B. lays out the job for Terry. Terry sighs. He shivers. What, B.B. says. Just cold. Fucking rain. I should have had another drink. Anything goes bad on this tear. Cut the guy loose and get clear. You're just there to drive, okay? B.B. hands Terry an envelope. It's the 3,000. It means something B.B.'s willing to pay up front. It means he trusts Terry. It means he's not worried about Terry holding up his end. He's not worried about Terry not doing what he signs on to do. Terry is driving to Newark. He makes a note the Pontiac needs new wipers along with its tune-up because all these wipers do is smear the rain across the windshield. Terry has to squint through a narrow, clear slit the driver's side wiper manages to leave in the middle of its smear. Terry thinks this is like driving a tank, looking through a little slit. B.B. has, more than once, told Terry his idea of management. B.B. has said he doesn't like telling people to do something. He tries never to say to somebody, you have to do this. He doesn't like to give orders, but he still manages to get stuff done, even the dirty stuff. All you gotta do, B.B. has said to Terry, is leave a door open. Sooner or later, somebody comes through that door. So here's tiny Terry going through the door. He's running down Route 21 in the Pontiac into Newark and then onto Bloomfield Avenue. I gotta be out of my fucking mind, Terry says to himself. I gotta be some kind of fucking moron. He heads up the avenue until he passes Branchbrook Park. Then he hangs a UI. His guy is supposed to be waiting for him at the bus stop on the eastbound side of the avenue, right by the entrance to the park. But the guy isn't there. Nobody is. Fuck! It's dark in the bus shelter, so he reaches over and rolls down the passenger window to make sure he's not missing the guy in the shadows in the rain. But even after he rolls down the window, the guy still isn't there. Fuck! He considers bailing on the whole business, driving straight back to the Roma and telling B.B., Hey, look, I was there, but the guy wasn't. 
Not my fault. But he doesn't do that. He figures B.B. isn't paying him three grand to just drive so he can take easy outs. Terry pulls back into traffic, use the car around again, then cruises slowly up the avenue. Okay, he thinks. Guy's a little late is all. The rain, traffic. He's a little late, it happens. No biggie. He drives for a few blocks, slowly, eating up the clock. Brings the car around again to the eastbound lanes. He's not there this time, he says to himself. Then fuck it. I'm gone. I'm out of here. Fuck this. I went above and beyond. I can go back to BB with a clear conscience. I'll give him the fucking money back. I don't care. A couple of blocks up from the bus stop is a cappuccino place Terry's heard is a wise guy hangout. Whenever he's driven past, he's always seen caddies and BMWs parked out front, double parked for half a block, damming up the whole right-hand lane of the avenue. They never get ticketed. They never get warned. The cops drive by and never even stop to ask somebody to please move or properly park their vehicle. Terry has a hunch, so he drives slowly past the cappuccino place. He can see somebody heading toward the park. The leather jacket and long hair, stringy now in the rain, tells him young, a kid. The kid is carrying a bag from the cappuccino place. I'll bet this fucking Momo was standing in the coffee place getting himself a fucking latte or whatever these shitheads drink instead of being where he was supposed to be, Terry thinks. What he should do, he tells himself, is drive past him to the bus stop where he's supposed to be. Then he can go back to the Roma and say to BB, Look, I made two passes at the place and he was a no-show. Fuck it. I did my part. But the three grand in his pocket won't let him do that. Terry pulls the Pontiac up to the curb near the kid and toots the horn, leans over and rolls down the passenger window. The kid with the bag from the cappuccino place is off in his own little world. He's still walking, head down into the rain, like he hasn't heard the horn. Hey, dickhead, Terry calls out. You the guy supposed to be in a bus stop? This does get the kid's attention. He comes over to the car. The way he moves... Terry can't tell if the kid's just dense or stoned, or, God forbid, both. You the driver? Terry doesn't put his face close to the open window. He doesn't want the kid to get a good look at him. If you're the guy I'm supposed to pick up. At the bus stop, the kid says. Right. You were supposed to meet me at the bus stop. You were supposed to be at the bus stop, like ten fucking minutes ago, dickhead. I'm supposed to sit in a rain, waiting for a cop, give me a ticket for standing in a bus stop. Get your ass in here. The kid climbs in. He notices the roof light doesn't work. Hey, what's with the light there? Nothing wrong with the light. The kid starts tapping on the light dome. Maybe you just need to... Terry has pulled out into traffic, and now he's pulling over to the curb again and stops. He turns to the kid. He can't see him well in the car, and that's good. He doesn't want to know what the kid looks like. More important, he doesn't want the kid to know what he looks like. There's just what Terry can see when headlights go by, and the light comes through the windshield, speckled with the shadows of raindrops and rivulets of water when it sweeps across the kid's face. He is young, got some whiskers growing on his upper lip and chin like patches of bad grass. If this kid's twenty, Terry thinks, I'll eat my hat. Listen, dickhead, Terry says. The light's fine. Everything's fine. You just sit there and take care of your end. My end's fine, okay? You just worry about doing what you gotta do. Hey, okay, all right, the kid says. Hey, take a chill pill, dude, okay? Take a chill pill, Terry says to himself and sighs. He pulls the Pontiac back into traffic. He follows Bloomfield Avenue across the park into Spanish territory. Signs creep into the rank of tired stores on either side of the avenue that say Groceria, Lavanderia, Licor. Small second-floor window signs are for offices of abogados and are crammed with information like Hablas Español, Immigracio, Impuestos, Criminal. There are places where you can wire money to suit America and take out food places smelling of spicy pollo and carne. What's with these wipers? the kid asks. Can you even... Let me give you a little advice, kid, Terry says. They tell you be someplace at a certain time. You be there. It's awful out. I wanted to get something hot to drink. I haven't had anything to eat. I know it's awful out, 
It sucks out, that's good. Nobody can see you. Then you go and walk in where it's all lit up. It's all full of wise guys, so maybe there's cops watching. That's real fucking smart. Dickhead. Were you in there bragging to the maid guys, huh? Telling them you're on your way and all that shit. I just bought myself a cappuccino, that's all. I kept my mouth shut. Did you know anybody in there? I know some of the guys, yeah. You talked. I kept my mouth shut. Where'd they find you, kid? Whose nephew are you? Look, you gonna bust my chops all night? Terry drives down to where Park Avenue's four lanes cut into Bloomfield Avenue. He hangs a right and Park Avenue turns uphill, coming off Bloomfield at an angle, heading back toward the park. It's residential here, still all Spanish. Cars pass them and they can hear their radios blasting loud Latin music, even through the closed windows. They pass Clifton Avenue and Terry can look down the block to his left and see Sacred Heart Cathedral. The rain catches the floodlights around the cathedral in a halo around the high spires. Didn't the Pope do something there? The kid asks, nodding at the cathedral. Why? He a friend of yours? Terry doesn't know why he can't stop being mad at the kid. Every time this kid opens his mouth, Terry wants to bark at him. Terry gives the cathedral a quick look while they're stopped at the traffic light on Clifton. He used to live a couple of blocks from here when he was a kid over on 7th Avenue. Him and the other kids from the block used to play football in the grass along the granite walls. Listen, dickhead, Terry says. I'm not going to pull up or anything, but you'll see it. You should get a look as we go by. It's going to be off to your right, just a couple doors in on Parker. Which one's Parker? Terry shakes his head. The kid snags a little luck. Terry catches the light at Parker, a narrow one-way emptying out onto Park. It's all two and three family homes, sitting shoulder to shoulder in there. There's not enough curb space for the number of drivers living on the street. There's so many double-parked cars down there, it looks like a parking lot. On the far side of the street, a few doors from the corner, like Terry said, is a little groceria. See it? Terry asks. The kid nods a small, tight nod. The kid's scared. The light changes, and Terry drives on over the crest of the hill, then down toward Branch Brook Park. He pulls off on Lake just before the park, hangs a U, pulls back onto Park, and drives back up the hill past Barringer High School. Just past the intersection with Parker, he pulls to the curb, kills the lights and the engine. They can look over their left shoulders to see across Park and just far enough down Parker to see the gross area. I don't know why you couldn't just pull up on that street, the kid says, nodding at Parker. Cause look at it, dickhead. All these little side streets around here, it's the double parking capital of the world. You want me waiting for you out there and I get jammed in? How'd you like that? The kid shifts in his seat. It just looks like a long way to walk. So, you walk. It's a long way for me to run back. After you get out, I'll pull around and park on that side of the street. You come out the store, I'll be right there at the corner. Don't worry about my end. The kid's quiet then. He sips on his cappuccino, he munches on a cannoli he pulls out of the bag. He keeps turning to look over his shoulder. This is killing my neck. Turn round in a seat. The kid is a gawky thing. He can't seem to make any move smoothly. Try to do it without kicking me, Terry says. Sorry, you want a sip? He holds out the cup of cappuccino. No. How long do we wait? Till he gets here. I mean, how long? I mean, what if he's not coming tonight? How long do we wait before we figure he's not coming? Relax. An hour couple hours. Oh, man. The kid goes back to sipping his cappuccino and eating his cannoli. When he sips on his drink, he does it with a long, loud slurp. Do you mind? Terry says. You sound like a bad fucking drain. It's hot. Terry keeps telling himself to relax, to calm down. So the kid makes noise when he sips his cappuccino, so what? The kid's right. Take a chill pill, dude. Terry slouches back in his seat and closes his eyes. His head is starting up again. He fumbles through his pockets, looking for the mitle, but thinks if he starts popping mitles in front of this kid, the kid would start busting his balls about doing mitles. Terry slouches a little more and pulls his hat down over his eyes. Let the kid watch the store. That's his job. They sit like this for a while, the kid slurping his cappuccino. Then the kid says, You got the time? No. 
Terry puts his hands down in his lap so the kid can't see his watch. If the kid starts worrying about the time, Terry's afraid he's going to be asking every five minutes. This rain's driving me nuts, the kid says after a while. He rolls down his window and pretends he's shouting at an upstairs neighbor. Yo, give it a rest, huh? He grins at Terry. Terry shakes his head. You want to roll up the window now? The kid shrugs and rolls up his window. Oh, shit. Terry tilts his head so he can look out from under the brim of his hat. The kid has taken a bite out of his cannoli, and the filling has dripped out the open end down the front of his jacket. You wouldn't have a napkin or something, would you? The kid asks. Sure, I'm fucking meals on wheels. The kid's quiet for a little while then. Maybe he's not coming. I mean, how long we wait before we figure he's not coming. I mean, do you want to be here all night? You got some place to go? No, I'm just saying. An hour, okay? And don't ask me when an hour's up, I'll tell you. The kid flicks on the radio, but since the car's engine is off, nothing happens. Hey, flick the key, would you? Terry sits up and flicks the radio's power switch off. Are you watching the place while you're fucking with the radio? I don't think so. Look, why don't you kick back, huh? I'll watch. Close your eyes for a bit. Now it's the kid's turn to get snippy. How the fuck am I supposed to sleep, huh? How the fuck am I supposed to close my eyes? Could you close your eyes? Terry doesn't say anything, but his answer would be no. The kid sighs. Mind if I smoke? I'll crack the window. He already rolling his window down. Don't crack the window. You shout out the window. You want to play with the radio. You put smoke out the window. Why don't you just put up a fucking neon sign outside? The kid rolls up the window. He's sulking now. Jesus, Terry, Terry tells himself. You relax, never mind the kid. Crack the window, he says. Have your smoke. You want one? Terry shakes his head. I don't see you around, the kid says. Terry shrugs. I'm with different people. This the kind of thing you do? I'm just driving, just this one time. Well, they must know you pretty well, right? To put you on this? Kid, I don't know you. I don't know who put this together. I don't know what this is about. I don't want to know, okay? They say drive the car, here I am. Let me give you a tip. You don't want to know nothing, neither. Terry pushes his hat back on his head. The kid's eyes are glued to the groceria. His eyes are wide, like a kid afraid of the dark. You think he knows? The kid says. If he knows, he won't come. The kid gives a nervous little laugh. Not even a laugh, really. Just a small, huh. I don't even know him. I mean, I don't even know who he is. Like I said, kid, you don't want to know. I'm thinking, maybe if I knew. Oh, shit. The kid sits up. There's a tall, slim guy in a natty-looking raincoat and a wide-brimmed hat, almost a cowboy hat, coming down the other side of the street, hunched over against the rain. That him? The kid says. They told me you'd know. I think that's him. Kid, you better be sure. That's him, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Kid. Yeah, yeah, it's him, okay? The kid throws his cigarette out the window. Yeah, okay, yeah. Time to go then. You okay? The kid nods. He's fumbling around in one of the pockets of his leather jacket. Look at him. He's not even looking for anybody. The man in the sort of cowboy hat turns into Parker and skips across the street to the groceria. You never did this before, did you, kid? The kid shakes his head, like he's embarrassed. Terry's thinking, nothing to be embarrassed about, kid. A big mistake thinking that it's something to be embarrassed about. What did they give you? The kid finally gets a small revolver out of his pocket. Looks like a toy, a twenty-two. Terry figures. Terry takes it from him, wraps the bottom of his jacket around his fingertips so he doesn't leave a print, and pops the cylinder out to make sure all the chambers are loaded. I was hoping they'd give me an automatic or something, the kid says. This is practically a cap gun. This is fine. All these kids want cannons, Terry thinks. Too much TV. The twenty-two is all you need. A revolver so you don't leave casings. Terry can see somebody's wrapped tape around the hammer, the trigger, and the grip. Somebody's taking good care of the kid. You just touched the tape, right? Yeah. You sure? It's your ass, not mine. Yeah, just the tape. Terry hands the revolver back. Should I put the safety on? There's no safety on a wheel gun, kid. Well, what's... 
Don't touch that. That's not a safety. It releases the cylinder. For a moment, for the first time, Terry feels bad for the kid. The kid is going through that door B.B. talks about, just like Terry's going through it. For a moment, Terry wants to say to him, Kid, you don't have to do this. Fuck it. We'll go back to that place. We'll both have a cappuccino and a cannoli. We'll tell them the guy didn't show. But that three grand is burning in Terry's pocket like a blowtorch, and those words don't come out. What he does say is, Listen to me, kid. You listening? After he goes inside, get out and walk over. Don't take your piece out. Keep your hands in your pockets. Keep them dry. When you're under the awning out front, then take it out. You don't want to have to pull it out inside. Maybe have it get caught on your pocket or something. You listening? The kid's eyes are glued to the grosseria, glazed, like he's hypnotized. Listen to me. Wait till he's at the counter. He'll be concentrating on the counter. Walk inside. Keep it by your side. And Terry shows him how. Don't be a smartass. Don't think you gotta say something clever like, in a movies. Just walk in, walk up behind him, put it against the back of his head. What if he turns around? Then you stick it in his face. But don't talk to him. Don't talk to nobody. Don't think about it. Just walk up and do it. The kid nods. Twice. Twice? Two times, to be sure. Can you do this? The kid nods again, his head moving jerkily. Go. By the time you come out, I'll have the car waiting for you at the corner. The kid opens his door. Listen, kid, you fuck this up. Go out the back door and keep running. Don't go home. Disappear, understand? The door closes, and the kid, in his dark jacket, is almost invisible in the rain. As soon as the kid reaches the other side of the street, Terry starts the engine. It's late, and there's hardly any traffic, which is good. He pulls the car out without turning on the headlights, pulls up the street just far enough to be out of the eye line of the grosseria, then hangs a UI and pulls up at the corner just down from the store. On the outside, Terry is ice. He's so still and cold on the outside he can feel it. Inside, he can feel his heart pounding the way it would pound when some Charlie would let an RPG go into the NHA trying compound, just for laughs, just to shake them out of bed. Terry would fall out of his bunk, scramble out of the barracks on his hands and knees, and drop to the ground. The earth is your friend, the D.I.'s back at Fort Jackson had taught him, and Terry would hug the earth like a long-lost friend, a long-lost, dearly beloved, digging his fingertips into it like he could pull himself even closer and he'd feel his heart pound against the dirt. That's how his heart is going now, and it's making his head throb. He feels like his eyes are going to pop out of their sockets from the pressure in his head. Where is this fucking kid, he's thinking. He shouldn't be this long. He should be out. Just drive, huh? Just fucking drive. Is this just fucking driving? Count thirty. If the kid's not out, he must have fucked up. Then screw him. He's on his own. My ass is out of here. His head hurts, and he's scared, and he's mad. He's mad at B.B. for putting him here. He's mad at himself for letting B.B. put him here. And he's mad at the shop and the idiots from Lyndhurst and his ex's lawyer and every other goddamn thing for putting him here. And he's mad at Wild Willie for killing the rich kid's blazer and not being here instead of him. And he's mad at this kid. And that's why he's been a shit to him all night. He's mad at the kid for showing up. He'd like it, really like it. If this thing with his head would let up for five minutes, just five fucking. The passenger door springs open and the kid almost falls into the car. He's dripping with rain, gasping for breath. Even before the kid gets the door closed behind him, Terry has the gas pedal to the floor. The Pontiac's tires slip on the wet street. The car fishtails. Terry doesn't panic. He lets up on the gas until the tires grab, turns the wheel into the skid, and the car's rear settles down and they're away. In two blocks, they're in the park, still with the headlights out, cruising along the lane paralleling Lake Street. Terry pulls up on the shoulder in a dark patch between street lamps next to a small pond. Gimme, he says to the kid. The kid is sitting there, still gasping, blinking his eyes like somebody hit him in the head. Gimme! The kid hands Terry the twenty-two. The gun is still giving off the acrid smell of fresh burnt powder. Terry has a small Swiss army knife on his keychain. He uses the bottom of his jacket again to hold the gun by the barrel. 
He uses the knife blade to cut away the tape from the hammer, the trigger, the grip, careful not to touch any part of the gun with his fingertips. He hands the kid the pistol back, dangling it from the trigger guard by his knife blade. In the water, Terry says. The kid climbs out of the car into the dark by the road. Terry can hear him squishing through the mud and wet grass. Terry balls up the tape and puts it in his pocket. The kid is back in the car, and Terry drives. In the pond, right? Terry says. Some of these morons think it's cool to keep the gun. In the pond? Yeah. Terry doesn't press it. He's already told the kid it's the kid's ass. He wants to be stupid. It's on him. Where do you want to go? He asks the kid. The kid seems to have his breath back. Terry gives him a quick look. The kid still looks a little dazed. It hasn't sunk in yet, Terry thinks. It won't for a while. It'll feel unreal to him. And tomorrow he might even wonder if it really happened. Where do you want to go? Terry asks again. I don't know. You want to go for a drink? Where do you want to go? Terry asks. He says it in a way that lets the kid know, you're going your way, I'm going mine. Terry winds through the park and winds up back on the avenue where it passes through Belleville. They've gone far enough that they can't even hear the sirens swarming in on Parker Street. Terry pulls to the curb. Get a cab or something, he tells the kid. You got money for a cab? Don't go for a drink. Don't hang out with your friends. Go home. Watch TV. The kid steps out into the rain. He looks like he wants to say something, but Terry doesn't stay for it. Terry drives back to the shop and pulls the Pontiac inside the garage. He cleans out the kid's cappuccino cup and the bag from the cappuccino place and uses a shop vac to suck up all the cannoli crumbs. He douses the ball of tape with lighter fluid, drops it in a metal bucket, and sets fire to it. He puts the bulb back in the dome light, switches the license plates back. He makes a note on the paperwork for the Pontiac to replace the windshield wipers. He makes sure the shop lights are out, the burglar alarm set, the doors locked. Then he climbs in his Riviera and drives home. Back in his apartment, he cracks the window so he can smell the bakery up the street. He gets down his bottle of Jack Daniels from the kitchen cabinet. He flips on the TV, AMC, because he likes the old movies. It's something with James Cagney. Good enough. He sits on the sofa with a blanket wrapped around his shoulders, his bottle of JD in his hand, and his iguana curled up alongside him. He wonders what would have happened to his iguana if he hadn't made it home tonight. He drinks pretty steadily. He knows if he drinks steadily, eventually he'll pass out. He won't dream if he passes out from the booze, and he'd rather deal with a hangover than his dreams. We hope you have enjoyed this story. If you have, please share this audiobook with a friend. Your friend will appreciate it, and the Gigabizzle Buppenheimers of the algorithm will like it too.